Hello and welcome to part two of a two-part series on chapter three of Government in America uh, discussing federalism. Uh, so in the last video we talked about what the idea of federalism was. The idea that you have the national government is clearly in charge but the state governments uh, also get to be in charge of some things and have uh, a significant amount of power. Um, in this video, we're going to talk in a little more detail about how those two things function and how the federal governments and state governments sometimes are competing with each other and sometimes they're working together. So a couple of terms that you're going to need to know. Uh, there's dual federalism. Under dual federalism, then the federal government is in charge of something and they do everything with that topic. So national defense. It's the federal government that defends the United States borders. Pennsylvania doesn't really worry about defending the borders of the United States. That's the, uh, uh, the federal government's job. On, a, um, uh, on the state level, in dual federalism, the state government might be in charge of hunting laws or fishing permits. That's not something the federal government's going to get involved in at all. It's just the state's job, okay? So that's dual federalism, all right? You do your thing, you do your thing, and they stay apart, okay? Cooperative federalism is when both levels, both the federal and the state government, get involved in an issue in a certain way. So you have education, for example, okay? The, the bulk of the power over education rests in state governments, Okay. Pennsylvania is the level of government where a lot of the rules that affect our education and our schools uh, are done here in Pennsylvania. Okay. But there is also a national level. Um, there are There's money that comes from the federal government and there are rules that come from the federal government that uh, every school and every school system, every public school has to follow. Okay. So that's cooperative federalism. Uh, they they work together, um, and so when they work together, sometimes the state's going to want to do one thing, and the federal government's going to want to do something different. Um, this can happen a lot when you have a national government that's controlled by one party, like the Democrats, and a state government that's controlled by a different party, like the Republicans. Um, this happened a lot about six or seven years ago when President Obama would want people to do one thing, but a Republican governor in New Jersey might want the state to do something different, and they're both kind of in charge, so they've got to work out that disagreement. Okay. Now, one of the terms that will come up when you hear about this disagreement is the term devolution. Okay, Not revolution, devolution or devolution. Uh, the idea is that something is devolved. It's going down. It's going to a simpler, smaller point. So if a power is devolved, that means it's moved from the national federal level down to the state level. Okay, And there's a lot of talk about um, devolution or devolution uh, when you have situations like I was describing where the state governments don't like what the federal government is telling them to do, they will call for devolution so that they have the power to do the thing that they want. example of this is marijuana legalization. The federal government does not have any interest in decriminalizing or legalizing marijuana possession you know, anytime soon. But there are cities and states that do want to do that. So they're calling for certain drug enforcement powers to be devolved or to move lower through devolution so that they can try the things that they want to try. Okay. Um, now, whether a power is officially in the federal or in the state government, the federal government sets a lot of rules and then it tells the states and the towns and everybody else, you have to follow these rules. Well, sometimes it costs a lot of money to follow the rules. You've got to set up procedures. You've got to hire people to carry out the laws. You've got to, you know, uh, get supplies. Lots of things. Okay, uh, so you know, with, with education, there's the idea that um, 
you need to test students to make sure that they're making adequate progress. Well, who's paying for all these tests? Okay, these are issues that come up when the federal government tells the state governments to do things. Okay, these requirements are referred to with the word mandate. If you have a mandate to do something, you have to do it. You're expected to do it. And the question is, will that money uh, come from the state or will the federal government chip in? If the federal government says, yeah, I'm making you do this, but I'm also handing you this money to do it, you know, then there's some grumbling, but a lot less than when the federal government says, hey, do this and figure out how you're going to pay for it. That's called an unfunded mandate, and you'll hear state governments complain about unfunded mandates very, very often. Okay. Now, when the federal government gives money to the states, it can take a couple different forms. Uh, there's a different variety of strings that can be attached or detached. Okay. Um, if uh, the federal government gives a state government a grant, they are giving money. Um, to help achieve some kind of goal. This is how you implement something that political scientists call fiscal federalism. Fiscal is about money and spending. Okay, So fiscal federalism is achieving some type of federalism through spending. Okay, Now, when the federal government gives a categorical grant, okay, they break the money down into categories and say you will spend this much money on this category of item. You will spend that much money on that category of item. Um, so it's very broken down and it doesn't give the states a lot of flexibility. Okay, So states are like, okay, sure, we'll take the money, but we're kind of grumpy that we have to do all these things. They much prefer block grants where the federal government basically drops a bunch of money on the table and says, hey, do something with this money that's going to help uh, homeless people or do something with this money that's going to help make schools better or whatever the case may be. Because then the state can do whatever it likes with the block grant and you know um, that may or may not actually achieve what the, uh, what the federal government was hoping to achieve with the money. Okay. Finally, um, when we talk about states' rights, okay, states' rights is a definite legitimate concern and an important issue in the United States. Okay, This relationship between the states and the federal government is a big deal. It's at the heart of our Constitution. It's the reason we have a federal and not a unitary government. All right, uh, But at the same time, you've got to be aware that the language of states' rights and the rhetoric of states' rights has a long history uh, that's tied up with our nation's history of racial injustice going back to slavery, extending through Jim Crow, and even up until today. Um, there are a lot of people who, in the past, when they were defending slavery uh, against people who wanted to make it illegal or make it harder or whatever, said, Look, it's fine that you abolitionists from Massachusetts and Pennsylvania don't like slavery. Make slavery illegal in your states. Don't come and tell me in Virginia or Mississippi what to do or South Carolina. Okay, It's a states' rights issue. When Jim Crow was put into place and segregation was legally enforced and st uh, states were making it harder for African Americans and minorities to vote, and people had a problem with that. Those states would say, hey, states' rights don't interfere with our ability to set our own rules. So if you ever hear of something being described as a states' rights issue, you've got to dig deeper and you've got to look into it and you've got to figure out, is this really a question about who should be making this decision? Or is this a question about not wanting the federal government to come in and try and do something to fix this uh, very awful legacy of discrimination uh, that goes back to our founding and the point at which um, the Constitution was saying that you know African slaves were to count as three-fifths of a person. Um, so uh, with that uh, sort of uh, 
final note, I'll uh, conclude this uh, discussion of federalism with some discussion questions for your consideration.